Alright guys, in this video we're going to take a look at the limit of exponential functions. So we're going to look at the limit as x is going to some constant c of a to the x. And this is going to be, we're going to be looking at it when a is greater than zero. And we're going to say that this is always equal to a to the c. And c has to be in the domain of a to the x, but it just turns out that means c can be any real number because the domain of a to the x is in fact any real number. So we're going to go ahead and look at this, but we're going to break this into three kind of uh, subjects, I guess. We're going to have a is going to be less than 1, a is going to be equal, oh and this is still greater than 0, a is going to be equal to 1, and a is going to be greater than 1, and we're going to try and prove all these. We're going to go ahead and prove a equal to 1 first, because as you guys are going to see pretty soon, that's pretty easy. If we go ahead and plug in 1 for a, we say 1 to the x power is always going to be 1. We get limit as x approaches c of 1, which is a constant, and of course that is 1, and we can check a to the c when a is equal to 1 is still 1. That's because a is equal to 1, and whenever 1 is raised to any power, you just get 1 right back. And I'm going to go ahead and erase this, and look at the next case, which is sadly not going to be that easy. We're going to look at a greater than 1. So you know that to prove this, we have to show that for any epsilon greater than 0, there is a delta greater than 0, such that if 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, then the absolute value of a to the x minus a to the c is going to be less than epsilon. So this is our epsilon delta proof, and this is going to be a little bit different than the ones we've done in the past, but hopefully if you just stick with it and uh, go through all the steps, it should make sense. This is something we did in our logarithmic proof, if you remember. This implies that if we pick an x value on some number line between c and c plus delta, or c minus delta and c, but not at c, so any of these values, not particularly at c itself, if we pick that x value and plug it in here, we will, get, we will find that a to the x minus a to the c, the absolute value of that, is going to be less than epsilon. And for any epsilon value we pick, we will be able to find that corresponding delta value. Well, what we're actually going to do in this proof is we're going to show that if we pick any delta value, or sorry, if we pick any x value between c minus delta and c plus delta, including c, we will still have this inequality hold to be true. And that will show that the limit exists. And the reason it shows that the limit exists is because if all of these x values work, then all of the x values in the interval excluding c itself, excluding c itself, will also work. By, so by showing, essentially by showing that if we're to pick an x value such that x minus c is less than delta but greater than negative delta, we have also shown that the x values defined by this inequality work. Why? Because this inequality right here defines a set of x values that are a subset of this inequality, this set. Because this set has all the x values between c minus delta and c plus delta, and this inequality has those same x values excluding x equals c. This just happens to have x equals c. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to try and prove that for any epsilon we can find this delta value. And to do that, we're going to do some algebra right over here with our epsilon inequality. And we're going to rewrite this as such. And that's just getting rid of that absolute value, saying that a to the x minus a to the c has to be bigger than negative epsilon, but it has to be less than epsilon for this inequality right here to be true. And we're going to go ahead and simplify this. We're going to add a to the c. Sorry, that should be a minus sign. It's going to be less than a to the x. It's going to be less than epsilon plus a to the c. We're going to take the log based a of both sides. So the log base A of both sides, 
And one of the reasons we, we're looking at this when a is bigger than 1 is because when we do things like take the log base a uh, or raise something, take a and raise whatever the expression is to that eighth power, when we do that with when a is smaller than 1, these inequalities tend to flip. So we're simplifying that by just looking at a greater than 1. So we get this right here, log base a of epsilon plus a to the c. And now what we're going to do is we're going to subtract c from both sides. So just so you know that that's in the logarithm. And this is where the proof gets a little bit different because what we're trying to say here is that if we pick an x value such that x minus c is greater than this expression but less than this expression, then epsilon will be greater than the absolute value of a to the x minus a to the c. But we have a slight problem right here where we have this log base a of a to the c minus epsilon. You'll notice that if epsilon is greater than a to the c, this expression is not defined because you can't take the log of a negative number. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to prove this uh, epsilon delta definition except instead of for any epsilon greater than zero, right now we're just going to prove it for epsilon values that are going to be less than, or less than a to the c but still greater than zero. So we're only going to prove it for epsilon values in this interval right now because if we use this proof for epsilon values outside that interval we find that we get back undefined values right here which we can't have. So if we look at this right here, what does this define? Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that this expression right here is a negative number. It's pretty easy to prove if you want. You can just set this equal, or you can set this greater than zero, and if you do some algebra right here, I'm going to pull that c over and I'm going to skip a step and I'm going to go a to each side, so I'm going to go a a to the log base a of a to the c minus epsilon and a to the c, so you get a to the c and you get a to the c minus epsilon and oh I flipped the sign here, this should be a um, this should be a less than sign. So we have that less than sign right here and if you simplify this even more it comes out to just being epsilon greater than zero. So as long as epsilon is greater than zero this quantity is negative and we know that epsilon is greater than zero. So now I'm going to do something I did in that last proof. And this is just to simplify what we're looking at. I'm going to say delta 1 is equal to c minus log a a to the c minus epsilon. And if you'll notice this is negative delta 1. So negative delta 1 is less than x minus c and I'm going to make delta 2 log base a of epsilon plus a to the c minus c. So great, less than x minus c is going to be less than delta 2. So this lets me know if I pick an x value such that x minus c is greater than negative delta 1 but less than negative or but less than delta 2 then I will get back an absolute value of a to the x minus a to the c value that is less than epsilon given that epsilon is less than a to the c but greater than zero. So if you look at what this interval is going to look like, what these x values can be, it's going to look something like this where this is c, these are my x values, and this is going to be c plus delta 2 and this is going to be c minus delta 1. So what I want to do is find some overall delta value such that if I was to just go c plus delta and c minus delta all those x values would give me back the absolute value of a to the x minus a to the c values that are less than epsilon. And I can do that just by finding the minimum of these two, so the smaller of delta 1 and delta 2. I know it exists, uh, just for the sake of finding it, I'm going to go ahead and find it, but I want to find that value because that delta value will define an interval such that all the x values in that interval will give me back uh, a to the x minus a to the c values such that the absolute value of that is less than epsilon. And why is that? Because for example if delta 1 was to be smaller than delta 2 then if I was to go to c plus delta 1 on this side all the values here 
are still falling in the interval between C and C plus delta 2. So that would be a subset of that bigger delta value. That smaller delta value would give me a interval that is a subset of this interval right here. So all my x values would still continue to work. So I'm going to go ahead and try and find which one of these is smaller. And I'm going to do that with a bit of guess and check and just see if it comes out to be right. So I'm going to guess that delta 1 is bigger than delta 2. So let's see if I'm, if I'm right. Um, so I'm saying that delta 1 is bigger than delta 2. We're going to do some algebra. And I'm just going to add C to this side. So you get 2C is greater than log base A of epsilon plus A to the C. And I'm going to add this log, log base A of A to the C minus epsilon. And we know that based on the property of logarithms, I can actually join these two together and kind of multiply what was inside them. So epsilon minus a to the c, and now I'm multiplying those. And you can see that this right here is actually a difference of two squares. So we can simplify that even more. We get log base a of, it's going to be epsilon squared minus, it's going to be epsilon squared, oh, I made a little mistake right here when I added this to the other side. I flipped this minus sign, so let me fix that. That would have given me the wrong answer in the end. So when I do this difference of two squares, it's actually going to be a to the 2c minus epsilon squared. Now I'm going to go take both sides and go a to the power of those two sides. And what I get back is a to the 2c is going to be greater than a to the 2c minus epsilon squared. And if I simplify this even more, I get epsilon squared is greater than 0 or that epsilon is greater than 0. And we know that's true. So as long as epsilon is greater than 0, delta 1, right here, this is delta 1, will indeed be bigger than delta 2. So the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2 is going to be delta 2, and we're going to call that our overall delta value. And if we use that as our overall delta value, we know that should we pick any epsilon greater than 0 but less than a to the c, there is a delta value such that if 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, then the absolute value of a to the x minus a to the c is less than epsilon. And that delta value is going to equal delta 2. It's going to be log base a of epsilon plus a to the c minus c. So if you give me any epsilon value that's less than a to the c greater than 0, I just plug it in here and I find my corresponding delta value. And you might be thinking, well, what about the rest of the epsilon values? What about all those values when epsilon is greater than a to the c? You're right. I still do have to show for those epsilon values that some delta value does exist. But it's actually quite easy to show that. If we take a look at a graph of some function, let me draw some exponential function, although it doesn't necessarily have to be an exponential function. I'm going to look at the function right about here. Let's say this is c and let's say this is a to the c. So what, you're, what I'm saying is that I have shown that if you give me an epsilon value that's less than a to the c, I can find a corresponding delta value. So if you give me something like this, where this is a to the c minus epsilon, and this is a to the c plus epsilon, I can find my corresponding delta value. So this is going to be minus delta and this is going to be c plus delta. And I haven't given you a delta value for when epsilon is really, really big. So when epsilon is around this size. Well, it turns out, as you might already be able to see, I can just use that same delta value I found for that smaller epsilon. And this is key, because if I use that same delta value, I still get a to the x values that fall within a range of epsilon of a to the c because that original epsilon that's here was smaller. This bigger epsilon is a much bigger width, and that smaller epsilon interval is a subset of that bigger epsilon. So by proving that I can find an epsilon for any value less than a to the c, 
I can just use some delta value, some delta value for corresponding to an epsilon value less than a to the c. I can use that same delta value for any epsilon values greater than a to the c. So that means I can find a delta value not only for epsilon values less than a to the c, but also for any value greater than a to the c. And that is how you prove that if a is greater than 1, then the limit as x goes to c of a to the x is equal to a to the c. And now we're going to go ahead and we're going to go about proving this for when a is between 0 and 1. And the way I'm going to do that is, let's say, instead of a, let's just call it b. So we can, you know, use a different variable. It gets a little bit, di a little bit less confusing. So what we're trying to show is that the limit as x goes to c of b to the x is equal to b to the c. And this is what we've already proven. So this is almost like a given now. It is like a given now. We know it to be true. And this is what we want to prove. Well, we can define some a value to be 1 over b. Why is that? Because b is less than 1 and a is greater than 1. So we can find some reciprocal of b such that it's going to equal a. And now here's what we're going to do. We're going to say the limit as x goes to c of b of x, or b to the x, is going to equal the limit as x goes to c of 1 over a to the x, which is just going to be the limit as x goes to c of 1 over a to the x. Now, if you remember, when we found the, uh, when we did our properties of limits video, we showed that the limit as x goes to c, if the limit as x goes to c of f of x is equal to l, then the limit as x goes to c of 1 over f of x is equal to l, 1 over l. And we showed this when we were doing our quotient property. So the limit as x goes to c of a, of a to the x is equal to a to the c. So the limit as x goes to c of 1 over a to the x is going to equal 1 over a to the c, which can be written as 1 over a, the quantity to, c, to the c power, which is then b to the c. And that shows that the limit as x goes to c of b, where b is between 0 and 1, uh, b to the x is equal to b to the c. So we've effectively shown that for any uh, exponential function, whether a be between 0 and 1, equal to 1, or greater than 1, that the limit as x goes to c of a to the x is equal to a to the c.